God. So we're going to jump into a new series this morning, and for the next three weeks, we're going to be digging into this series. And at any moment, I want you to be open to receiving what God has for you. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is a series that, that I have felt nudged uh, to go in this direction basically since the beginning of the fast. Uh, I knew that this uh, was coming up, and I kept going, okay, God, do you want to create a new series? What do you want to do? And he reminded me that I've done this series once before, but I did it years and years and years ago. And how many of you know that sometimes you get all of the old notes out, you go reading it, and you go, what? God had grace. Uh, because this was terrible. Uh, what was being, not because it was bad word, but because it was poor English. And my typing skills weren't great. Uh, and so I, I pulled this series back out because uh, I felt like the Lord was like, this, is a, this was a good one, and I want you to do this one. So we are, and I've been revamping it as I go. But it's called Power for Life. And for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go ahead. And listen, we're going to be Pentecostal people. Because I, I, I want you to understand that... This is the Word of God. Right from the start, you need to understand that the, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of, of speaking in tongues, the influence of the Spirit of God, all of that is in your Bible. It was not drummed up by a man making up a fluff story to give fantasy to the church. Okay, go ahead. Everything that I'm going to share with you over the next three weeks is in Scripture. In fact, we're going to go to quite a bit of it because we're laying some groundwork for you. And, and I, let me jump to the end and tell you, for this next week, I want you to pray. I want you to, uh, you, you'll understand, but I want you to make room. Mm -hmm. yes. Go ahead. When we get to that, you'll know what I'm talking about. But I want you to make room because I believe that God's going to do some things in our midst. Yeah. Oh. It's going to be wild yeah. and awesome. And awesome. Yeah. So you know the context is always important to understanding the scripture. Because, you know, most of the time you start talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, everybody wants to go to what book? Acts. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll go there, but we have to lay some groundwork for you. You see, because Luke and Acts, written by the same guy, they're connected to one another. So we're going to start in the book of Luke, or the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at verses 24 through 49. So I want you to go there, and we're going to read that here in just a second. So here's what it says. Then he, talking about Jesus, said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. me. So stop for a second and note that all of the Old Testament is about Jesus. Right. Yeah. Just so you get it. All of the Old Testament is about him. Even the prophets that we're like, what? But yes, all of it is about Jesus. And he opened their understanding. This is what Jesus did. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Amen. Behold, that means check it out. Right. I send the promise of my Father upon you, Hallelujah. but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power yes. from on high. The, 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 the overall title of this series is called Power for Life. Understand, he said, I send the promise of the Holy Spirit of my Father, but wait in Jerusalem until you are endued. He's linking that the promise is an endowment of power. Yes. Yes. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel a little old school Pentecostal Assemblies of God a little bit for you. So you're still doing this. 
we're reaching back to 1914 in, in, in Arkansas. You know, we're, we're going to reach back there to our understanding here. So here we get a glimpse of the intended reality of the church and how it was to look on this earth as a kingdom representation. You need to understand, you cannot read the letters written after the book of Acts without having the context of the book of Acts. You, you will not ever understand. You will take bits and pieces and apply them, but Paul and Peter and John and all of them, they were, they were writing to a church that had experienced what was talked about in the book of Acts. In fact, the book of Acts is the context for all of the letters. It's the time frame. So the letters are not written after the adventure that's written in Acts. The letters were written during. That's right. That's right. So when Paul talks about the Spirit, he's talking to people who are familiar, not to people who are unfamiliar, not to people who have separated from it. This is, well, okay, and you got it. The church, this is what Jesus is saying in Luke, is a gospel living Repentance leading and sin remission preaching body. You want to know what you are ordained to do? Yes, the signs following, the laying hands on the sick and seeing them recovering, casting out devils and doing all of that. That's wonderful. But Jesus commissioned us to be a gospel living, repentance leading, sin remission preaching body. Amen. Okay, I'm going to say that to the front row because they seem to be the ones that are most into to hear this this morning. I think it's good if we dispense with the thought that Jesus suggested and offered options in this passage. Go ahead. Come on. He didn't make a suggestion of what the church is supposed to look like, and he didn't give us options to determine how we were going to look. He said, here's what you're called to do, and here's how you're enabled to do it. Yeah. There is no second choice. There is no option B in this. He expected it. Maybe it's because we began to water down the expectation that we've gone the directions that we've gone. So this was an expectation. There is power you are to receive. It is coming. It is guaranteed. This is not a joke. Luke continues to write to Theophilus in the Acts of the Apostles, and he retells Luke 24 in Acts chapter 1. See, I told you, Luke and, and Acts are connected, so we've got to look at this. He gives us some more of the conversation that had taken place. So in Luke, he gives us kind of a, hey, this is an abbreviated conversation, but in, Luke, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, he gives us the entirety of this conversation. So let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Listen, I haven't even started giving you points yet, so if you're writing stuff down, awesome. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them, he's talking to his disciples, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you might be. No, no. You could be. No. No, you shall be yeah. baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come, now, so in light of this, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, now remember, this is all conversation. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Praise God. Praise God. See, Jesus calls this a baptism. The disciples knew that baptism meant something. It was a sign of allegiance and following. It was a sign of cleansing from the filthiness of the world. But Jesus wasn't talking water. John baptized with water. In fact, 
Paul would argue, would argue later on in Acts, he would say, uh, into what baptism have you been baptized? Well, into the baptism of John. That surely is a baptism of repentance. That is a baptism that you need. It's a good thing, but I'm talking about a different baptism that you need to understand is for you. Well, if I don't get all the dogs to be excited about this, I'm getting the hose that's outside. <laughs> He was saying that this baptism goes way beyond cleansing. Because see, I need you to understand something. Water dries off. But the Holy Spirit isn't just going to be upon you. He's going to be in you. See, Jesus says in John chapter, there about 16, 17, he says, I'm sending the comforter, the paraclete, the, the one who's just like me. You're going to know who he is. But, and identify him because he is just like me. And you're going to know him because he's been with you. Yes. And will be in you. Yes. Come on. And so Jesus is saying that this spirit baptism is going to be something that is much deeper than a dip in water that dries off. And then you all have to go and prove yourselves to prove that you're Christians. Because the evidence dries off of baptism. We, we, we all know. We go and we dry off. It would be nice if we were to get up out of the baptismal trough and stay wet. Right, right. Then we'd be like, well, what's going on? I've been baptized. Permanently? I'm permanently wet. I take a shower. I go wet. I dry off. I'm still wet. It doesn't really matter if we were to see it that way. So Jesus is saying the first step is that water baptism. It's getting into the flow of what the kingdom is doing and coming, and, and, and coming alongside me, not me coming alongside you. You coming alongside me and moving forward in where the kingdom is going and the expansion of the kingdom on the earth. So get in that water. Yeah. Water is nice. Yeah. Right. Unless we forget to turn the heater on, then it's not nice. <laughs> water is good. But Jesus says, now that's the first step. The next step is that you're going to have something that sticks with you. Yeah. And the evidence does not disappear Come on. unless you put a cap on it. Right. That's right. Go ahead. Now, he didn't say that part. I'm saying that part. He spoke of anointing. And anointing means purpose. Jesus has an anointing he wants to place upon you and in you for the purpose he has called you to. So now the disciples are super excited, right? There's this purpose. They think they know the plan. But just to be sure, here's what they ask. Jesus, when you have given us this power... Are you going to restore again the kingdom to Israel? In other words, are we going to be in charge? Because you need to understand that all of Israel, even today, is looking to throw off the weight of every government that has ever sat upon them. Yeah. Because it's a promise that comes in Scripture. They're to, not just going to be a nation allowed into the UN. That was wonderful. That's recognition. But they are to throw off the shackles of every bit of bondage that has ever been on them. And they are to be the kingdom of all kingdoms on the earth. So you know, the United States is wonderful, but Israel is where it's at. I know that's hard for all of us great patriots to understand. But the Bible in Revelation is not talking about the United States. Because in the big scheme of things... We're believers who will be caught up to meet him in the air. And when Jesus returns in the book of Revelation, he's not coming to get the bride of Gentiles and Jews who have believed in him before. He's coming to redeem the nation Israel and establish them the way that they're supposed to be as they are. Y'all need to be with me today. So you can get excited about this with me. So Jesus' response is where we begin really looking in this message. This is the foundation for the remainder of the book of Acts. Of the apostles. He says this. It's not for you to know. That's right. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Let that sink in. Right. It's not for you to know. You see, this seems counterproductive, right? I mean, how many of us actually think that if we knew what was going to happen in the future, that we would be ready to handle it? No, no, no. I tell you, that's, that's, that's the truth. No. The truth is, is that more information would not give you peace. That's right. 
it would make you worry about the stuff that's yet to come. Yeah. Yes. And you'd start to develop solutions for it on your own. Yeah. Stuff that hasn't even happened yet. Right. The reality of it is, is Jesus gave them the best answer he could possibly have given them. He says to them, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. He, he didn't say no. He said, it'll happen when God decides for it to happen. But that's not the point. The point of spirit baptism isn't so Israel becomes the nation. It's so that you get out there and promote kingdom until God goes, okay, it's time to return the kingdom to Israel. So what is he saying to us? It's not for you to know the details. It's for you to walk in the spirit. It's, for not, it's not for you to have everything lined out minute by minute by minute by minute of your day so that you can expect the unexpected and have an answer for every time that it turns on you. It's for you to walk in the spirit constantly, continuously, in fellowship, in filling with the spirit of God. This is what he was saying to them. Stop worrying about the stuff that matters but doesn't matter. Amen. Come on, brother. The more we try to assist God, the more we get in God's way. God doesn't tell us stuff because he wants us to wait so that he can handle it with us as it comes on the scene. Come on. Oh, we don't like that, though. i got to write my plan in the book. i got to do it to the letter. You know, my, my dad was, uh, he was in the National Guard. And um, it was wonderful uh, for him to be in the National Guard. He goes to Fort Sill there in Lawton, and he gets his books on how to wage war, and he's got all of this stuff and the instruction. He worked with the, uh, he, he was the man who called the coordinates out for the, uh, the MLRS, which is something they still use, which is the multiple, it's a, a rocket launcher, but it, multi, it, it shoots them. It's a lot of it. It's, it was pretty cool to even stand next to it. Never got to go in it because I think they were afraid I would win. <laughs> what does this button do? But, you know. So I never got to be a part of that. But we would watch all of these military movies. We would watch all of this stuff with my dad. And he's always, you know, he was very critical of things. Uh, like most guys who have served are critical of military movies. It's like, that's not how it works. That's not what happens. And he would say things to us like this. He would say, son, uh, understand that th this is what they teach you. Yes, it's wonderful to have the book. But in the middle of war, throw out the book. Do you know, they should be teaching that to kids that go to seminary. Because it's wonderful for you to have all of the knowledge in seminary on how church is supposed to be. But when you get into church leadership, throw away the book. Because the book doesn't tell you about people's attitudes. And the book doesn't tell you about laws. And the book doesn't tell you all of those things. So you need to have something that moves you beyond the knowledge and preparation that you have. Come on, somebody. You've got to understand that, yes, you can have all the knowledge in the world. But without the Holy Spirit in your life, you will not engage the purpose of God the way you're supposed to engage the purpose of God. Somebody hear that this morning. <laughs> No, not the Parkinson no. <laughs> See, the big idea for us is this, simply this, and, and then we're going to get into actually the points. You guys, I, I could have altar call now. No. Yes, Confidence, here's the big, the, the thing I want you to take. Confidence comes not from knowing the specifics, but rather from knowing the source. Yes, Amen. Right. Good. Confidence comes not from knowing the specifics. It comes from knowing the source. Jesus has given us power by the Holy Spirit to know and trust the source. So in Acts chapter 2, or excuse me, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 48, here's what we here's how we can respond to his command that it's not for us to know. I, I, I want us to, to write these down and we'll dig into them. Number one, realize I need an experience with the Holy Spirit. I need an experience with the Holy Spirit. Now understand, we have already, from the beginning of the year, redefined what experience means. Experience is not how you feel about it. Experience is what you gain from it. So we all need to gain... 
from the Holy Spirit. We need to gain from the Holy Spirit. I'd probably go that one step further and say it needs to not just be a singular gaining. It needs to be a continual gaining with the Holy Spirit. So much to gain. And we have the tendency to undervalue our need for the Holy Spirit because we often try to live this life in our own strength. We too many times God is the last resort. We ask him, hey, have you prayed about that? Well, you know, no, but I've been talking to all of my friends, and this is what we really think I should do. Okay, but did you talk to God about it? Well, no, I don't want to bother him. Okay, then listen, never call your father for a favor ever again. Ooh. Never call up your daddy for a favor ever again. Because you know, my kids know, if they call me, what's up? As long as they're not 16 hours away, I'll be there. <laughs> no, but if they were, we would, we'd sell one of the other siblings who are close by. <laughs> Spock in my own logic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want to bother you. So then you think that God is an absent father. Right. And you treat him like that. Yeah. When he's not an absent father, he has placed himself within you. Why would an absent father place himself inside of you? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. See, when we face challenges, we try to solve them with striving and worrying and manipulation. The Holy Spirit has so much more wisdom and insight and power than we do. He's so much better than any of us, and there is really no comparison. He has so much more joy and strength and even a better attitude. The best part, he lives inside of every believer and wants to share what he has with us. He desires that we live out of his strength, not our own. He has the power to change our lives. And there are actually two primary things that we gain that we need to realize we gain. Everyone needs to have this. The first one happens when we surrender our lives to Jesus. John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. He's the originator. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now you need to understand, this was born again. This was the born again moment for the disciples. Consider that the only other time that man was breathed upon was when God breathed upon Adam and he became a living soul. Jesus is reenacting. Just like God went at the day of creation and he creates Adam and he breathes into him, Jesus is saying there's a new life you need to have. And Listen, don't misunderstand that, and, and, and this is no hate for people that do this, but my goodness gracious, it is not a theological practice to walk around and breathe on people. Go ahead. The, I, I'm, I'm being honest with you, and, and not because if God tells you to do it, you, should, you, you shouldn't do it, because if God tells you to do it, that's wonderful, but you don't come to a breathing conference. Amen. Go ahead. Come on, come on. Besides that, you don't trust the person that wants to come and breathe on you unless you see that little white round thing that goes in your mouth. Come on, amen. I'm just messing, y'all. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Jesus was only doing what he'd seen his father do, and he breathed upon them, signifying new creation, needing a renewed life. 
Then he gives them the command of receiving the Holy Spirit. Up until this moment, the Holy Spirit would come upon for a brief purpose, but would not be dwelling in them. Read the Old Testament constantly. The Spirit of God came upon and they did. And then it left. Excuse me, not yet. He left. The Spirit of God left. Then would come back for a purpose. Then would come off. Then would come back for a purpose. Then would come off. Jesus changes the narrative because John says, I knew who the Son of Man was, who the Son of God would be, who the Lamb who takes the sin of the world would be, because I was told by, it, by prophetic revelation that the one upon whom I would see the Spirit descend and remain. He's the one. And Jesus says the same things to happen to you. The Spirit descends and remains. That's the change. That's the change. Descend. Wonderful. Woo! We get emotional when the Spirit of God descends in the house. But we need Him to remain. Yes. Uh, salvation opened the door for the Spirit of God to enter into the life of the believer. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells within us the moment we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. So I need you to understand something. You are given Holy Spirit at salvation. You have it. No question denying. No, no, no denying it. We're, we're, we're not denying that you are given the Spirit of God. He comes into your life when you... In fact, He's the one who baptizes you into Jesus Christ. Yeah. The Spirit is engaged in the reality of Christianity. He's there. So when He comes, He is with you. In that moment of salvation, He is with you. He becomes that voice that says, Hey, that's not what Jesus would do. Right. That's good. Okay, so you understand that. But Jesus is saying it's more than just this visitation, this momentary baptism in, in which you get to hold the hand of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God doesn't just want to hold your hand. He wants to be your hand. He wants to be inside of you. You are a vessel created to carry. Yeah, come on. So this is what this is what he's saying. This Holy Spirit comes in. Now the second thing that we gain is baptism. Wait a minute, what? Jesus said you are saved and you have the thumbnail of the Holy Spirit within you, but there is more. More. Come on, say it with me. More. Mas. <laughs> say it in Spanish, everyone. Mas. Okay, yeah, that's good. That's right. We're all, we are one. That's good. Yes. You need the Holy Spirit to come upon you in overflowing and give you power to begin living the supernatural life. Being saved and having the Holy Spirit live on the inside of you isn't enough to do life at the level that God's created for you to do uh, to do it at. In other words, so we need to understand that being saved and the Holy Spirit holding my hand is not enough. Right. Come on, we need the Spirit of God to be we dwelling did. in us yes, for that what we can't handle. Hallelujah. So that we can do the things yes. that God has called. Now that, that doesn't remove the believer's authority to cast out devils and do all of those things. I just I don't misunderstand. But Jesus himself said there's a fullness you must have. Yes. He commanded it. So if we take Jesus at his word, he commanded them. He's commanding us. If the Bible is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. If it is living then, it's living now. And so you need. Secondly, realize that I need, we need the explosiveness of the Holy Spirit. You can look at Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses uh, of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, the word power there is the word dunamis. We all know that this word is the Greek root from which we get the word dynamite. Yeah. But another word that comes across that is related to dynamite is dynamic. Mm -hmm. 
Dynamic is a word that means characterized by energy and effective action. So when you look up, and I know this is grammatical, but when you look up the etymology of this word, it takes you back to another Greek word, which means to be able to have power to be strong enough. So what Jesus is saying is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive energy that is making you effective. It makes you strong enough to be effective in action. Yes. You know that explosive implies that it is something that works from the inside outward. Right. Yeah. Yes, come on. Explosion is. Yes, come on. Implosion is self-contained. God has not given us a spirit that implodes. He gives us a spirit. He says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's an outward. It starts in and comes out. So we need to understand that when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, given the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives, inundated with the fullness of the Spirit of God, it's explosive. It moves us outward. It expresses outward. It moves outward. Power of God goes forward. Never just stays here. inside out, not this outside in. Many of us pray that God would fix our external situations by changing people and circumstances. But the reality of the kingdom is that the Holy Spirit doesn't simply change the external, but rather changes the internal. And in the process begins to change the external. So we come around and we start asking God, God, change my situation. Change this relationship. Change those people. I really, I love them. I hate them. <laughs> but God, it's not me that's the problem. It's them that's the problem. It's they that are the issue. It's they that have the attitude. It's they that are mean. It's they. And the Spirit of God says, let me work on you. And you go, no, 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 Spirit of God. Because if you don't reach out and touch them, I'm going to reach out and touch them. <laughs> But you understand that the Spirit of God begins to work on, the moment I start praying about a situation, God starts changing my perspective about the situation. He doesn't change them. Amen. But in the change that takes place in me, they become acclimated to the change that's in me. Which means they may hate you worse if you begin to love them the way Jesus loves them. When you begin to walk in peace that you've never known before, it's like, why do I have it? You know what? It's, it's not even, it's a peace that goes beyond understanding, but it's a peace that says, look at them, I love them, and I really don't care what they think about me. I really don't care what they say about me anymore. They, they can call me the whatever it is in the workplace. That's fine. You go ahead. You, go, you call me that. I know who I am. I am all he has said I am. I'm a son. There are daughters. I'm not a daughter. There are daughters. You get what I'm talking about. There's a change that takes place on the inside. The Holy Spirit is not just this moment where you... Uh, and, and here's the thing that, that we've got to remove. And, and, and I, I'll be honest with you and tell you that the Pentecostal church has been the, has been the harm in this one. Because we think that being spirit-filled just means we talk funny. <laughs> and so all the other denominations that come out and, and watch how we respond to the Spirit, they go, well, there's no real change in them, so that's just blubbering. Because if the Spirit of God is supposed to truly bring change, and you're all like, oh, the fullness of the Spirit is what we all need, but you don't change, no wonder they don't want it. I'm just saying, don't shoot the messenger. Thirdly, we need to have or gain, uh, uh, we need to gain an expectation of the Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting, right? We need to expect that the Holy Spirit wants to work in us. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Now, you do this by creating space in your life. Let me give you an example. My son is home for a semester. It's wonderful. I love my son, but he's home for a semester. <laughs> but Stacy and I had this thing called empty nest. <laughs> and empty nest provoked us to get rid of stuff. <laughs> we started getting rid of things. We were like, oh, we don't need that. We don't have kids who live with us anymore. There's no reason to have any of that stuff. So we take it and we give it away. We find some other uh, sucker that has food for kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Not suckers, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying. But, but isn't that what all parents who have empty nests do? They go, oh, you know what? We used to need five beds in the house. We only need the one, so let's just give everyone's bed away, and let's, you know, let's rent rooms to people, and we took out one son's bedroom and turned it into our office, and so, you know, if he comes over and he's like, we, we, we went, when, uh, uh, after Christmas, when they had no running water, they had to come to the house, they got the blow-up mattress, because there is no bed, that's our office now, we've moved stuff, we've moved along, it's time to move along with us. <laughs> right? Because you're creating an openness for something else to begin. A new chapter is begun, so you take the clutter and you get it out of your, le out of your way. Come on, that's good. Y'all know we're, 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 we're being funny, but y'all have the comedy to help you get this. And so here's what Jesus says. The reason he says wait is not just because we're supposed to wait. It's because we're supposed to wait. And we're supposed to get rid of wait. Y'all got that one for free. <laughs> here's, how it, here's how it works. It begins in praise. Yes. 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 It begins in praise. Yes. When you consider the greatness of God and the things that He has done in your life, you begin to see the possibilities. Yeah. Now, I, I want you to hear this. Praise <coughs> is not saying, I praise you. We go, somebody give some praise, and we go, we praise you, Lord, we praise you. For what? Listen, I have never, well, y'all will laugh at this, I've never had a coach come up to me after a good game of refereeing. <laughs> uh, minus the over-the-back calls. And say, oh, I praise you. No, he comes up to me and he goes, you know what, that call that you got in the, in the, in the third quarter, that one, that, that, was, a, that was a great call. Mm -hmm. my, fr my fellow refs, my co-officials come up to me and go, yeah, dude, that was, that was right on. That was a good call. What you did there was right. Mm -hmm. Don't mistake. That's what praise is. Praise is not going, oh, I praise you. No, praise is giving God the attaboy that he deserves. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise is always what God has done. We praise God for what he has done in our lives. So when we say, you saved me, we say, oh, that day that I, oh, I when I got saved that day, oh, attaboy, what you did changed my life. When there is healing that has taken place in your life. Listen, we, we all, oh, I praise you. No, let, let me tell you something. Uh, we found out that we were pregnant with Ethan the day I found out that I had stage four melanoma. Same day. I can be happy or I can be sad. <laughs> but we're going to pray. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Sure. Well, Pastor, did what? What happened? Did you did 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 you get healed? Well, I'd like to think I got healed. Yeah, I went to the doctor and they had to remove the thing. Sure. 
they did their little uh, scope stuff. And then they were like, you know what, let's just, and you always, I, I give God praise because I believe that God was going to heal me, but I also wasn't dumb. And I went through some of the process. So I go and I have my surgery. And they take this 8 inch by 4 inch diamond out of my calf of skin. And the doctor told me it took two very buff nurses to help put my skin back together so they could sew it. They took out that much. Looked like a shark bite to this day. It still kind of does. And we go to the doctor weeks later after they've done the pathology on the piece of skin and all of that stuff. And he says, man, he says, this is the most incredible thing because stage four, it should be here. It should be here. It should be in every lymph node that's in your system. You're at state, You're dying. And he goes, we looked that entire square inches of that, that piece of skin and we found one singular cancer cell. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Not, 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 a, not a patch. Not, not. Did they put the skin back? I wish they would have put the skin back. But, they <laughs> but here's what, but what happens? How do I know the God can heal? Atta boy, God. Atta boy, you're just showing off now. See, way to go, way to go. See, the way you did that, just in the nick of time, right in the right moment, you told the doctor something different this time. That's good, God. That's good, God. That's awesome, God. You're not saying to, like a child, like you're at your kid's baseball game when they hit the ball off the tee four feet and then make it to first base. You're really excited about what God has done. You're talking about what God has done. When you give God praise, it's not just this... Listen, no one tells me a good job by looking at me. Come on, brother. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Read my mind. Okay. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> I know. I'm not going to say it. So. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise God. God. In my eyes. No. Why? Because he says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mouth speaks. How do we start making money? We start with praise. We start unloading the praise on him. Because it's good. Listen, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I got saved before it took. I'm thankful that it took. I remember the day I got baptized. I was like six. I got baptized when I was six. That day, I had I, we had hymnals. Yeah. We sang in them hymnals yeah. in that musty sanctuary that was back in the back on uh, Colorado Street in Chickasha, Oklahoma. And then, at the end of service, we're going up there to get baptized. I was so excited. I've never sung the hymns as loud as I could possibly sing them. I was so full of joy, and I remember that day of being baptized. And and and, and I can say, okay, God, I remember six years old. You, I, I, I decided to follow you, even if it was six years old. I decided to follow you, and you graced me and loved me and I'm so thankful for that and you kept me out of some stuff that I could have gotten into and you let me take some steps into some garbage that I shouldn't have gone into but you let me do it anyway but you had this string attached that kept yes. going hey no 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 come on back because you are mine I remember that. I remember the day I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I, I, I remember who prayed for me. I remember I didn't want him praying for me, but I remember the who prayed for me. Uh, I remember all of it. I, I remember, you've heard it before, I remember the day my dad got saved. That's one of those days when you live as long as, it, and, and you're, Dad just likes to dabble the toe in there every once in a while to make himself feel like he's close to the church, but not really. And he's still doing all of the things that he wants to do and says. And it's just the same old guy with no change whatsoever. And then you get to hear the story of when he truly got saved. God, thank you for saving my dad before he died. Amen. Good. Good. Why? Why do I tell that story? So that you may have an unsaved loved one. And if God can save them, can save my dad in the moment, he can save you yes, in the moment. Amen. 
You get what I'm saying? We praise because praise is a testimony of who God is. It's always about what God has done. Mm. See, praise opens your eyes to God's greatness. It allows your will to get involved by submitting to God's will. You engage this moment of surrender through confession, making room, moving out the clutter that creates confusion. God has been willing to meet you and work in you since the very beginning. Yeah. The other thing you do, God spoke to Moses, you build an altar. Yeah. I need you to hear this. You build an altar. And he would meet him there. Yeah. Be reminded that an altar is a place of sacrifice. So it is a place to pray, but it was established first as a place of worship. It was sending a notice who the God of your life, your home, your city is. We talked about this in Sum It Up, and if you have not looked at Sum It Up, you need to. That's a very big plug for that. I enjoy doing that with my wife, and I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. But be, but be reminded, Abraham comes walking over Mount Hermon. Because that's up in the northern part of the, of the country. He comes walking over Mount Hermon. And God says this. He says, look. Look everywhere. As far as the eye can see. This belongs to you. This belongs to you and to your descendants. And the very first thing that Abraham did. He didn't go, yes, I'm rich. <laughs> He built an altar. Right. Now I want you to understand something. The altar he built was a declaration. It wasn't a, it, they were not familiar in this land with this altar. They had no idea what this altar was. So Abraham walks into what is about to be his promised land and he establishes a beacon to let everyone know the God of this nation, the God of this land is him. And then he travels down a little bit further and he builds another one. Yeah. And then he goes another place and he builds another one. And then his sons take up the charge and they build an altar. Jacob goes and he yeah. builds an right. altar at Bethel and he names it the house of God. And he's gone for 26 years and he comes back and he reconsecrates the altar of God in that spot. Saying this is the God of the house of God. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was establishing a spiritual reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was establishing a spiritual reality. And it prepared him for God to come in and take yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. over. Yeah. That's good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Built an altar. He's sending a notice to the God of your life. Your home, your cities. In the Old Testament, they, the, you knew the people you were approaching not by town signs, but by altars built. Mm -hmm. They didn't identify you by a, by a, a sign that says, Welcome mm -hmm. to Jericho. <coughs> it's by the altars that were built. Yes, sir. Yes. They didn't go, Oh, hey, welcome to Sodom and Gomorrah. We're happy to have you. You identify Sodom and Gomorrah by the altars that we go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't have time to get into that. Yeah. But you make room. You create an altar. I'm closing. You expect God to work through the Holy Spirit to explosively move through you and in you and bring what you gain that we need to make it in this world, walking in the purpose He has lined out for us. And so this whole, this whole next week, listen, I, I, I'm laying the groundwork. I'm trying to lay this biblical groundwork for you to understand the necessity, the need of the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need, Paul prays it, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need this, not because it's trendy and Pentecostal, but because Jesus said it. Yeah. Amen. Pastor, that's that's not that's the, the way we read the Bible. It's not for today. What are you reading? All right. Absolutely. The, the the the. Why would he promise one thing 
at one time and expect us to carry on the mission thousands of years later without the same source. He wouldn't. So the promise is for you and for your children and for your children's children. As many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. So we prepare ourselves this next week. Here's what I want you to do. You start. Listen, if you've got to write it down, write it down. Write down everything that God has done you've done for you. And then begin to thank him. Begin to clap. And when we say things like somebody lift up some praise, it's I don't go, oh praise. I go out of boy. child of the king. That a boy. You saved me. You healed me. You delivered me. You set me free. All bondages are broken. Sin is defeated. I am free. Free indeed. I am a son. You hear me. You grant the promises of God to me. You have done greater things than this. Thank, thank you. And then you move on from yourself. You go, oh, thank you for the God-fearing woman that you put in my life. Thank you for the children. Thank you for the calling. Thank you for the gifts and callings that you placed in my life. Thank you, Lord. I, I thank you that, that, that you have done this, that you have done this. I thank you for healing me. I, I, th I thank you, God. And you begin to write those things out, and then you begin to thank. And then you say, okay, God, listen, i got to make some more room. There's clutter. I know. Listen, I, don't lie. Y'all have clutter. Amen. Yes. We all have clutter. Amen. Anxiety, depression, that's clutter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stress, strife, mm -hmm. clutter. Amen. Sin, clutter. Mm -hmm. Pride, mm -hmm. clutter. Mm -hmm. Listen, there's nothing like being an American in Nigeria preaching the gospel and they don't receive you because they see your pride before they yes, hear your word. I called Stacy three days after my first time to preach over there, and I said, I think I miss God. I don't think I should be here. She's like, it's three days. You've got to be there for two weeks. You better not miss God. <laughs> don't want me to come back. You're the one driving my bus around. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Guess, guess what I had to do? I went back to my room, and I stayed there with the TV off. Yes. And I prayed. Yes. And I prayed. And I prayed in the spirit. Yes. Oh my goodness. And God began to do some things inside. He goes, No, you gotta get rid of this, and you gotta get rid of this. And, and he kept going. I kept going, God, what's the problem? I'm anointed. These are some awesome, amazing messages that I brought with me to preach. And, and it's wonderful. And I feel so called and so alive. It's wonderful. And he goes, He goes, You know what's in your way? Pride. I'm like, God, I'm not prideful. I am not prideful. <laughs> I refuse that. I'm a, I'm a son. No, you're prideful. Well, God, how do you get rid of pride? Well, you have to give it to me. Okay? That means you don't ask God to take it. You give it. What else is called? Think about it. Think about all of the, the worry. Think about all of the, the stuff that's in your life that keeps you, prevents you from hearing God. Think about all of the logic that keeps you from hearing God. Christianity is a life of faith, ladies and gentlemen. There are logical elements, but it's a life of faith. So we got to remove the clutter in our lives. So this week, I want you to get this list of things to thank God and praise God about. And then as you're praying to the Lord, as you say, okay, God, what's the clutter? What's the clutter in my life? And be very, very easy. Very easy. You're right, God. You're right, God. That's right. Okay, God, I give this to you. And I may have to give it all every day, all week long. I'm giving this to you. I'm, I'm decluttering. I'm removing stuff. God, I'm shaping and reshifting where these rooms are. In fact, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to unlock the doors to all the rooms that are in my heart. This is so, so God, bring your movers in and start getting stuff out so that there's more and more room for you to be inside of me. I need you. Oh, I need you inside of me. I need the Spirit of God. Like I need water. I need the Spirit of God. Like I need air. I need you in my life. So remove whatever has to be removed. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Spend this time in prayer and preparation. Because 
is I believe God has commissioned you. And he wants to baptize you. The Spirit baptizes you into Jesus. And Jesus comes right along with you and baptizes you into the Spirit. We'll talk about that word baptize there next week. But prepare yourselves, church. Build up an expectation. The Bible says that my expectation comes from Him. He expects to baptize you. He expects to fill you to overflow. It's time for my expectation to be that same yeah, level hallelujah. for Him. Praise God. Yeah. So stand with me this morning. We're going to pray. We're going to sing uh, something upbeat and peppy. <coughs> yeah, we're going to sing something upbeat and peppy. We're going to have a good time. So everybody, I want you to lift your hands this morning. And we're going to pray a prayer, and then we're going to end the service with, with just singing some singing to the Lord. We're going to put that exclamation point on this. But Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Spirit of God. I thank you, Lord God, for all that you have done today, what you're going to do in this week, what you're going to do next Sunday, what you're going to do the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, Lord God, uh, through till the end of time, till you return. I thank you, Father, in advance for everything that you're going to do. And I pray right now over every person, every hand that is raised, Lord, every heart that is expressed, Every heart that is revealed right now, Father, Lord, that you begin to send in your movers and declutter their hearts. Declutter our hearts, Lord God. Father, that you open our eyes to see the things to praise you for, so that when we lift up praise, it's not a word. It is a truth. It is recognition of what you have done and who you are in our lives. And I pray, Father, that as we remove these things, the, the clutter in our life, as we lift up the shout of praise in our hearts, Lord God, Father, that you will come and fill the empty space. Lord, we make room, fill the room. We make room, fill the room. Lord, let the dynamic presence of the Spirit of God fall upon every person in this room. Lord God, may there be an expectation of infinity.